As Judge Glanville gears up for his recusal hearing, we reviewed his most recent court appearance to glean some insight as to how he will defend himself against charges of judicial misconduct. Glanville actually laid out his entire defense, and we are going to analyze it for you. Glanville's defense consists of at least three parts, adhering to Rule 2.9 of the Georgia Code of Judicial Conduct, conducting the ex parte meeting due to an emergency relating to a threat to Woody Copeland's life, and asserting that what happened at the meeting will not have an effect on the trial. Stay with us as we explore each of these prongs of Glanville's defense in more detail. 1. Glanville claims that the meeting was not prohibited because it did not deal with any substantive matter and did not give one side a substantive or tactical advantage. This would be in accordance with Georgia Code for Judicial Conduct, Rule 2.9. Um, as to Mr. Steele's first assertion of uh, whether or not the court held an improper ex parte meeting or hearing, the court is guided by Judicial Code of Conduct 2.9, uh, which I'll take judicial notice of, which um, in pertinent part, where circumstances require ex parte communications are authorized for scheduling, administrative purposes, or emergencies that do not deal with the substantive matters or issues, provided that the judge reasonably believes that no party will gain any or procedural, substantive, or tactical advantage as a result of the ex parte communication, and the judge makes provisions promptly to notify all parties um, of the substance of the ex parte communication and gives the parties an opportunity to respond. And in this particular circumstance, the transcript of these proceedings was just was just prepared uh, and is final by my official court reporter, Ms. Weaver. Additionally, under Rule 2.9, Glanville seems to believe, since he has released the transcript for the meeting before putting Woody Copeland back on the stand, he has given the defense timely notification of what happened during the meeting. 2. Glanville suggests that the ex parte meeting was conducted as an emergency after Mr. Melnick expressed concern that someone may kill Woody Copeland. Glanville cites a court case, the United States versus Adams, to support this contention. I'll address the issue of, of, the, of the emergency nature of this particular hearing or this particular uh, conference in front of the, to the court is that the, uh, this involves the state's concern as to what Mr. Copeland was in fact told by his counsel, Mr. Melnick, and his under and in Adams, the appellants contend that the ex parte conference was improper and it violated their due process right to a fundamentally fair trial. We agree with appellants that ex parte conferences should occur but rarely, especially in criminal cases. This does not mean, however, that such conferences are unconstitutional. Indeed, some situations, the trial judge may find an ex parte conference necessary. We cite uh, La Chapelle, and that's L-A-C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L -L versus Moran. Here is a brief overview of the United States versus Adams. Defendants were convicted of various offenses, including interstate transportation of a stolen motor vehicle, 18 U.S.C.S. Section 2312, and Conspiracy to Transport Stolen Vehicles in Interstate Commerce, 18 U.S.C.S. Section 371, stemming from their involvement in an auto theft ring. On appeal, defendants did not challenge the sufficiency of the evidence to support their convictions, but rather asserted that an ex parte conference between the district court judge, the prosecutor, and a prosecution witness was improper and violated their due process right to a fundamentally fair trial. The court affirmed the conviction and found that the ex parte conference was appropriate under the circumstances because the purpose of the conference was to discuss the witness's belief that he would be harmed if he testified. The court noted that at no time was the substance of the witness's testimony discussed and that the entire conference was transcribed by a court reporter. The court found that Although certain portions of the conference raised the appearance of impropriety, defendants were not prejudiced, and therefore no reversible error occurred. The court affirmed defendants' convictions because their due process rights to a fair trial were not violated by an ex parte conference between the district court judge, the prosecutor, and a prosecution witness. The court found that although parts of the conference raised the appearance of impropriety, it was not prejudicial to defendants and did not affect the fairness of the trial. 
Here Glanville also notes that transcription is an important part of conducting ex parte meetings, apparently insinuating that his own transcription of his ex parte meeting is in accordance with this principle. Glanville also cites La Chapelle versus Moran to further bolster his contention that case law supports judges under rare circumstances conducting ex parte meetings in order to protect witnesses. 3. Glanville states that the defendant's presence would not have affected the outcome of the ex parte meeting. Glanville cited Bruner v. State, which relates to the defendant's right to be present at all critical stages of the trial proceedings. Glanville concludes that his court did not violate this right because no party gained a tactical advantage during the meeting and the proceedings were released as a transcript. Glanville seems to indicate that the defendant's presence at the meeting would have been useless because the meeting was about questions of law and legal arguments. The court's also uh, considered Bruner versus the state, that's 302 Georgia at 6, and this relates to the right to be present and what, def what, what, def what is defined as a critical stage and under the Sixth Amendment. Bruner contends that he was denied the right under the Georgia Constitution to be present at certain critical stages of his trial proceedings. Embodied within the constitutional right of the courts to a criminal defendant's right to be present, see and hear all the proceedings which were had against him on trial before the court. Violations of this due process right are presumed prejudicial, absent a waiver by defendant requiring a trial. However, uh, there were no violation of Bruner's right to be present. The right to be present attaches to any stage of a criminal criminal proceeding that is critical to its outcome if the defendant's presence would contribute to the fairness of the procedure. And that's Huff versus the state, 274 Georgia, 110, pinpoint 111. Criminal defendant's right to be present under the Georgia Constitution attaches to any stage of the criminal proceeding, which is critical to its outcome if the defendant's presence would contribute to the fairness of the procedure, but the right does not extend to situations where a defendant's presence would be useless or benefit but shadow. And uh, under the Georgia Constitution, defendant who is represented by counsel need not be present for, uh, for portions of the trial that involve questions of law and consistent, consists of essentially legal argument about which the defendant presumably has no knowledge. So what do you think about Glanville's defense? Let us know in the comments and be sure to subscribe to our channel and like and share this video.